So, um, this is a project that uh, is born out of a collaboration between the Anthropological Institute and the Institute for Computational Science of the University of Zurich. And our group is composed by, uh, by myself, and Natalia Kachenko will be giving a talk later in this session, and then Jody Weissman, Wes Peterson, and the two PIs that are Christian Zolikov and George Lake. And uh, I would like to warn you, this is all pretty much a work in progress, so we just finished with the heavy development phase. So we're gradually transitioning into a science production phase, which we're very excited about it. And uh, so please bear with me. I hope I will convince you to just check out what we are doing in a few months. So large scale dispersals uh, are we all interested in. Uh, uh, why do we call them large scale dispersals? They're large scale for three reasons. One, uh, they deal with uh, large spatial scales. So for in the case of human dispersals, they deal with scales much larger than the typical foraging range of uh, hunter-gatherers. They deal with large numbers of individuals, and also they deal with large time scales, so time scales of hundreds or thousands of generations, so almost evolutionary time scales. Uh, and in terms of human dispersals, probably the prototypical case of a large scale dispersal is the out of Africa. So there have been two out of Africa dispersals, one two million years ago, uh, Homo erectus, and the uh, recent one 60,000 years ago. Homo sapiens, uh, and evidence for this is in the space-time data on specimens and um, uh, stone tools of Homo sapiens. There's more and more genetic evidence of uh, increasing genetic distance and decreasing genetic bias while going out of Africa through the traveled path, uh, which indicates like still a founder effect. And also there's evidence of interbreeding between Homo sapiens and people who remained from the first out of Africa dispersal. So the questions that we'd like to ask and hopefully answer are how and why did this range expansion occur? So what, was the, uh, what were the drivers? Was it climate? Was it technological advances? Was it some other kind of um, evolutionary advantage that Homo sapiens had? And what characterized the interaction between these subspecies when they met each other during this range expansion? So uh, to model this, of course, we need to uh, include Intrinsic properties of Homo sapiens hunter gatherers, interactions between uh, these individuals and the changing environment, interactions between individuals, within species and between species. And in principle, we would like to do this while exploring parameter space for our model for millions of agents and uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And, okay, I think nobody would be surprised if I say that agent based modeling is a great way to do this. Because you can include individual behaviors, you can include individual and bound interactions, individual and individual interactions, and also, let's not forget, we can include stochastic effects. And stochastic effects depend on the actual population sizes that we're dealing with. And these stochastic effects are very important because they can deal, for, they can um, give, for example, local extinction events, etc. So we must not forget them. So how do how do we include all of these in an agent-based modeling? An agent-based model framework that can deal with these kinds of numbers. What we did was to uh, develop our own code, QHG and HPC ABM code, a code for region based modeling and high parallel high performance computing. And here you see a pictorial representation of how it's structured. So the code uh, runs simulations on a grid that can be excited on, uh, on a sphere or a rectangular, on which you can define geography, climate, and uh, <coughs> vegetation if you want, depending on climate and geography. And on this grid, uh, populations of agents live. You can see them here represented as color dots um, on the hexagonal grid. And populations are um, characterized by, um, of course, their uh, parameters, behaviors, and uh, list of agents that belong to them. So, in order to have a program that runs faster, we uh, got rid of any kind of graphical user interface. But we developed some uh, input output routines with the standard data formats so that the output of the simulation can be visualized and graphically analyzed with a commonly available software. Anyway. So, the main features of our code are first of all performance, because uh, we use a simple and efficient memory structure. Uh, it's modular as an agent based modeling code should be, so you can assemble uh, the agents that you like, you can, you can program uh, new actions and you can put them together to make the computation that you like best. Uh, and we use a, a discrete time framework. So agent updates are all synchronous. This is very important because first of all, 
It lets you uh, have a well-defined time resolution for your model, so you know what is explicitly included in the model and what has to be implicitly included in the model, depending on the time resolution line. And also, in this way, you have no issues with the time ordering of the actions within a time step. Uh, the code is parallelized with OpenMP, so you can run it on uh, multi-core uh, shared memory machines. And so since we want to do this in the most performance efficient way possible, we are building the model gradually starting from the uh, very basics and then adding complexity as the code runs fast enough. So this is the most basic agent-based modeling of human dispersal that you can think of. Here you see just some agents on the hexagonal grid and here is what the time step goes through during the simulation. So you initialize the time step and the first thing, all agents look for a partner. <coughs> so uh, agents look for a, a suitable mate of the opposite sex, they live on the same grid cell or grid node. And once all the couples are formed and they are randomized at every time step so that the first woman in the list has always pair with the first man in the list, etc. Uh, you perform the birth action uh, with a specified birth probability, so all uh, female agents decide whether they will give birth in this time step or not. Uh, and you also have a death function that affects both male and female agents. And again, it's a birth, death probability and we decide if it's a or not. And then finally there is a move action uh, with which an agent can decide whether to stay where it, it is currently or whether to move to a neighboring cell. And since uh, uh, the time ordering of these actions must not be important, uh, the state of all the agents is updated only at the, in the finalized of the time step, so that the positions are updated, uh, dead agents are removed, and newborn agents are created with information about who their parents were. So, in the most simple case possible, we choose birth and death probabilities that are linear in population density, and this coupled with a, a synchronous random walk means that on large scale, we have a system that behaves like a fischer kolmogorov of random uh, reaction diffusion. <coughs> That uh, describes the evolution of population density in terms of a diffusion coefficient, a growth rate, and the carrying capacity, and gives rise to traveling population waves, which is what we would like to see. So here you see two snapshots from the simulation. You see uh, a grid on a sphere, and here you see agents color coded by their age. So uh, old agents are in blue, and young agents are in red. And you see that two different times how the population grows and expands with young agents preferentially at the front, where the birth rate is higher. And if you're interested in the parallel scaling of our code, this is the time it takes to perform a single action, normalized to death uh, action, as a function of the number of cores in which you run the simulation. And we are very happy because if you run the simulation on 32 cores, the code runs 32 times faster, essentially, than it runs on one single core. So it's a very good scaling. Now, all this uh, was quite abstract, so this was, yeah, with uh, say, this number of, five, of 2 million agents on the sphere or something. So, how to make this more concrete? Uh, we can define uh, GIS information on the, on the grid. So, this is what our grid looks like when we plot false color altitude and ice coverage. And now, once we define a scale for the system, then we can also define uh, what parameters we would like to have for the simulation. So we require to have one agent for every human individual in the simulation uh, with time steps of one year. And the cell sizes that we use are of roughly 55 by 55 kilometers or uh, 25 by 25 kilometers. And we uh, prescribe the rates of birth, death, and movement so that on large scales we recover uh, the rates that have been uh, observed for hunter gather modern hunter-gatherer populations. And the data, we take them from uh, NGDC uh, for the altitude, and then the sea level and ice sheet reconstructions come from the PTA simulations. So now let's see if I can dazzle you with special effects. This is what one of our typical new movies looks like. So you see here the agents moving in the original site in Africa. I can see the blue and red agents according to the gender. 
And if we fast forward so that now one frame is 100 steps, you see the population expanding in the typical fisher pomogorov wave and moving across Africa and Eurasia, etc. So of course, in a way, I'm, I'm cheating right now because this simulation started 70,000 years ago, so in a way, I start the expansion when the expansion starts, more or less. But in this very simple model, there is no consistent way to trigger the expansion from internal causes. So, so and now, if, now we are roughly 40,000 years ago, and the simulation is still running, but there is the uh, ice shelf in North America that is blocking the further expansion of the agents. But as we approach 15,000 years ago, the ice starts to melt, and very dramatically, the a corridor should appear through the ice, and the uh, hominin agents should be able to colonize also the Americas. Okay. Yes? It's happening? Yes! There we are. Hey! Great. So. Okay, so here you see um, a plot of the number of agents as a function of time in uh, kilo years. So you see that uh, there is a linear increase in the number of agents up until 700,000 when uh, Africa, Eurasia, and Oceania are colonized. And then the population stalls until the corridor opens, and then there is a further increase up to 900,000 agents. This is a very simple model, but even with this kind of simple model, we can start to ask interesting questions. Like, for example, what are the effects of different strategies of this person? For example, let's suppose that you want to prescribe that the agents avoid high altitudes. You can think of either because there's uh, less food available there or because it is more uh, costly energetically to move up a mountain. So you can specify two different recipes. You can say, uh, I don't know, the carrying capacity of a cell is a linearly decreasing function of its altitude. Or you can say, for example, that the probability of moving to a cell is a linearly decreasing function of its altitude. These are two different scenarios that kind of try to model similar things. So one, I'll call it the capacity model, and one, I'll call it the move model. So at the end of that simulation, if you plot the distribution of agent densities as a function of altitude of the cell, so here you see the number of individuals in a cell, and here you see the altitude of a cell, and so <coughs> Most of the system is in this state, but there are some cells that have fewer individuals here. And the green lines kind of <coughs> represent the prescription that you've put for the agent behavior. Here you have the capacity model, and here you have the move model. So you see that if you opt for a capacity model, the final distribution of agent densities will closely resemble what you have inputted in the, in the agent behavior. On the other hand, if you use a move model, uh, where the agents are smarter and try not to go up the mountains, still there will be high agent densities up the mountains because it is enough for a few agents to go there. And since you have not prescribed here that, uh, that there is a lower carrying capacity of the mountains, it's enough for a few agents walk up and then the population starts to grow. And even if agents then walk down the mountains because they're, because they're lazy, other agents will be born to replenish the population then. Another thing that you look at with this kind of models is. Uh, what is the distance traveled to reach a particular cell as a function of the time elapsed in the simulation? Again, here is the capacity model, here is the move model, and the points here are uh, for each cell and they're color coded by the longitude of the cell. So if you go from left to right, here you have in red the, the expansion through Africa and then Eurasia, and then there's a break, and then here is the expansion through the Americas for the two models. So you can see that the capacity models, since in that case the agents do not use any information about their environment. They decide randomly where to go, and then if they walk to an empty spot, they are lucky and they die. Uh, they travel much longer distances to reach the same geographical locations. While uh, the smarter agents or the lazier agents are the ones that travel the shortest distances. But what is also interesting is that in the 70,000 years that the simulation runs, uh, this model doesn't let agents reach South America, so they stop 
in Mesoamerica, more or less. And this is probably a combination of the more uh, of the slower dispersal and the fact that in Mesoamerica the environment is a bit difficult because it's a bit of altitude and there's a geographical bottleneck. So uh, Asians may walk forward, but then they die, and then you have to wait for a new population to come in. And so the population stalls them, as you can see here. Now, I was talking before about um, the effects of stochasticity and the number of individuals that you use in the simulation. In fact, uh, you can see here again, the, for a similar case, the travel distance versus the time elapsed. This is without altitude effects, so just flat continents, but no walking into the sea. And you see in blue the case where you have a carry capacity of 600 agents per cell, then in green it's 60 agents per cell, and in red it's 24 agents per cell. And you can see that while all the uh, physical parameters of the behavioral model are exactly the same, uh, since the noise properties of the system are different and the stochastic effects are different, the velocity of the uh, wave expansion is affected by the number of individuals that you use. Now, another reason why to do agent-based models is that you can follow individuals. Uh, so one thing we are doing at the moment is to trace individual lineages because we know exactly every, for every agent uh, uh, who gave birth to him. So what we can do is that you can build synthetic genomes for the initial population and then allow for uh, mutation and crossovers and uh, reconstruct the genetic history of the population. Of course, this is computationally very expensive, so unfortunately, I only have an intentionally difficult to read dendrogram of the genetic data of the final agents because it's a very, very preliminary results. But it's possible to do it. And you can uh, think of doing it in two ways. Either you record the lineages of the agents and then you reconstruct the genetic history later on and you play different mutation rates, different initial uh, mix, genetic mixtures in the uh, starting population, or you can do it on the fly. So you have only one genetic realization of the dispersal, but you get the data right away as you finish the simulation. And it doesn't take much longer to run. So the movie that I showed you before uh, on 16 cores uh, takes roughly a couple of hours to simulate almost a million agents. Now, how to make the model uh, more complex and a bit more realistic? Well, of course, you can include the effect of climate uh, in terms of vegetation. So, it's known from data for, for hunter-gatherer populations that the uh, uh, density of individuals of hunter-gatherer population more or less kind of correlates with the net primary production of the environment today, with a, a lot of considerable scattering. And you can try to fit uh, a linear relation up to a certain uh, density of individuals, and then things kind of flatten out. So uh, what we're doing is that we're including this type of uh, model coupled with a uh, vegetation model in dependence of the temperature and precipitation and bridge pyrochromic reconstructions to simulate uh, how uh, the biomass availability influences the automatic dispersals. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, quantitative data to show you, but you can see here a snapshot of one of these simulations. So you have in green and yellow hues the density of vegetation, and in this kind of uh, Chianti purple, you see the density of uh, hominin agents. And what is interesting to see is that uh, when you uh, modulate the carrying capacity of the population with the vegetation, for the data that we have, uh, habitats can become marginal for the agents. So uh, it could be, so there are many more random extinction events. And that depends a lot on what is the size of the starting population. So it changes dramatically if you decide to start with 100 agents or with 10,000 agents. In the first case, usually hominins go extinct before they can go out of Africa. And another interesting point is that while in the classical model, if you increase the diffusion coefficient, the speed of the wave of advance increases, uh, in the stochastic agent-based model, if you increase the diffusion coefficient, uh, you do not always have dispersal. And this is because you need to wait until the population builds up a little 
Uh, and then if there's a bit of momentum, and then you can start <coughs> to expand. But if the diffusion coefficient is too high and the initial population is too low, agents can start to disperse without finding mates, and then they will all die and the population will go extinct. So this also hints to the fact that probably uh, the very next step to go into would be to include the role of group behavior for hunter gatherer societies and how to keep these agents together, even though the groups themselves can have a high diffusion coefficient on a larger scale. And then, of course, uh, the climate reconstructions are very coarse, so not very high resolution. So, we are also including the fact of patch environments and possibly uh, different uh, modes of uh, dispersal, like lady flights. So, in conclusion, I hope to have made you curious about QHG for its high performance capabilities and uh, uh, its increasingly modular agent design. And uh, <coughs> yes, so we started running million agent simulations of automatic dispersals. They're very simple at the moment, but we want to do things carefully, understand what's going on, and make the code fast as possible. And what we'd like to do in the near future, of course, uh, some modern validation with archaeological records of the human expansion, <coughs> and implement more complex models, maybe also with herbivores and not only vegetation. Included multiple subspecies, so the Neanderthals and the Venezuelans, and see what kind of interactions we get to. And then hopefully also get, uh, run bigger and faster simulations uh, by di using different parallelization paradigms and maybe even GPUs. That's it.